So RESP, these are the things you need to know for your Zap. <coughs> non RESP function for the alarm, there are many in the morning. This is one nice one. Also asked regularly in uh, MEDEX. So drug administration, do you all know what drugs can be given through the ETT? What's that mnemonic? Naval, eh? Okay. Reservoir. So there's about 500 mils of blood in the lungs which can be mobilized. So when patient goes into shock, hypertension, you can have venoconstriction which pumps the blood out of the lungs into the systemic circulation. It has an immune function, it has a mucus layer, cilia, it has the alveolar macrophages for dust cells, you have lysozyme to produce, IgA. It has a fil filter function, so it filters out embolisms and all that, uh, thrombosis and all, thrombus. It filters out air bubbles. Are you, all, are you all aware of this air bubble filtration function? How important it is? Because all of you zoom out air bubbles into the venous circulation. So it's actually the lungs which is removing it. Okay, that's why the patient doesn't get obstructive shock and collapse. Yeah? Because of that. And then you have the fibrinolytic function. So it breaks down all the thrombus and all that. So most of the time the lung is doing its job well, but no one knows about it. No? The lung is the people who do their work quietly, but no one recognizes their, their efforts. But when things go wrong, you get PE and everyone blames the lung. The so thermoregulation is because one of the sources of heat loss is through the lung, respiratory heat loss. It's a synthetic function, it makes a factor, you know, type 2 alveolar cells. Acid base regulation, because we know in as part of acid base, CO2 is important, so CO2 is where the lungs uh, is eliminated at the lungs. And metabolism, so it makes angiotensin 2, it has angiotensin fermenting enzyme, it makes bradykinin, prostaglandins. Uh, Metabolizes drugs. Okay. So control of breathing. So do you remember just now the baroreceptor reflex? The concept is the same. Okay, you have a sensor, controller, effector. So for the respiratory system, the sensor, the main one is the central chemoreceptor, which is in the medulla. And you have the peripheral, peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid body or sinus. Body. So remember, carotid sinus is a baroreceptor in the body. Yes, sir. Chemoreceptor and the aortic arch. You have all these other small sensors, probably don't need to know in detail, but be aware that they exist. For example, barrier receptor. For doing hypotension in shock, you also have tachypnea because of this. Barrier receptors can also stimulate the breathing. Pain receptors, you know, patient in pain, tachypnic, patient demam, tachypnic, all this, patient emotional tachypnic, all this is because of the other receptors, other sensors. So the controller is in the medulla. And the effector is the muscles of inspiration. So central chemoreceptors are responsible for 80% of the response to CO2, but they are slower. And remember, they detect change in CSF pH. They don't detect pH CO2 directly. That means, as you can see in the picture, the CO2 needs to, in the blood, need to dissolve, diffuse through the blood-brain barrier. It needs to combine and then become carbonic acid, dissociate, so the hydrogen ion will reduce the CSF pH. And that is what is sensed by the central chemoreceptor. So it means it cannot detect hydrogen ion directly, it cannot detect plasma pH, acidosis. So the peripheral chemoreceptors are in your cutter body, in your arch, as I mentioned. So cutter body is the using the glossopharyngeal nerve, you the arch using the vagus nerve. So peripheral chemoreceptor is responsible for 20% of CO2 change, but it acts faster. 100% response to PAO, PAO2 change, but not content. Remember oxygen content equation just now? If your PAO2 is normal, more than 60, but let's say SpO2 is low or hemoglobin is low, your chemoreceptors won't detect it. It only detects tension. PAO2 is tension, oxygen tension. And it's responsible for 100% of response to plasma pH. But this is only the carotid body, not the aortic arch. Remember just now, the plasma pH, it cannot cross the blood brain barrier. 
So control breathing curves look like this. It's how the CO2 affects the minute ventilation. So focus on this line first. This is normal. The relationship is linear. So as CO2 increases, ventilation increases, right? But at this end, it flattens out because if CO2 is too low and you start hypoventilating, you end up having hypoxia as well. And the oxygen will start stimulating, so it flattens out. At this end also, it flattens out. Anyone know why? Why when CO2 is so high, the minute ventilation starts to drop? Can you see dropping again? Eh? Yeah, CO2 narcosis. Good. So this second graph is to show you what happens when you give things like opioids or benzos and so on. For patients with COAD, OSA, their curve shifts to the right. So they become either higher threshold or lower sensitivity. So they need a higher CO2 for the same minute ventilation. Understand, right? So the relationship is linear. Oxygen is different. So let's focus on the bottom line, huh? ignore the top line. So oxygen on the x-axis, minute ventilation on the y-axis. So as oxygen drops, PaCO2 5 means a normal CO2. So when the CO2 is normal, as the oxygen drops from 30 to 10 kilopascal, which is about 100 to 60 mmHg. So from up to 60 mmHg, minute ventilation doesn't change. Understand? PaO2 drops from 100 to 60, minute ventilation doesn't change. Not like CO2, which is linear. But once PaO2 drops below 60, minute ventilation increases. So the minute ventilation only increases, the recipe center is only stimulated once PaO2 drops below 60. Okay? So this second graph is to show you that there is a synergism. Color CO2 normal at 60, in the ventilation increase, the oxygen 60. Tapi if the PaCO2 is high, this is about 70 millimeter mercury, the curve shifts here. That means oxygen will stimulate the recipe center at a higher PaO2. Ah. Synergism. Understand? So, color CO2 normal, 60 baro oxygen will stimulate below 60. Color CO2 is high, that happens at a higher level. There's no exact number, but it means at a higher level, which is 70 or 80 mmHg oxygen, you have hyperventilation. Okay? And this also explains the last graph, why at the bottom of the CO2 curve, it flattens out. As your CO2 goes too low, you hypoventilate. At some point, as you hypoventilate too low, your oxygen starts to drop. And when it drops below 60, you start hyperventilating again. So you cannot hypoventilate until you did. It's not possible. Unless, you know, lah, you give GA or something, you know, like, just, you cannot just do it uh, voluntarily. Okay, lung volume capacity, again, super boring, but all of you need to know. Most important here is this FRC. Okay, FRC is roughly about 30 mil per kilo, composition of these two. Okay. Oh, the other thing is um, all of them can be measured by spirometry except anything with residual volume. So you cannot measure this with spirometry, you cannot measure this with spirometry because it contains this residual volume. You need a special way to measure. So what is the definition of FRC volume and the lungs at the end of tidal expiration? When the lung elastic recoil equals the outward recoil chest wall. That means the lung is trying to collapse and the chest wall is trying to go outward, spring up. When they're evenly balanced, that is the FRC. So it's equal to residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume, about 30 mL per kilo when you're standing up. So the mnemonic for functions is bra for me, bra for M. It's a buffer. It ensures there is always oxygen in the lung. Imagine if FRC didn't exist. So now your alveoli is full of oxygen. All the oxygen is absorbed into the blood. There is no FRC, so the alveoli will collapse. So during that collapse, there is no oxygen transfer. But because there is an FRC, it does it, it splints the alveoli open. Okay? It contains nitrogen, eh? which is 70% of the room air. Eh? Splints the diaphragm of the alveoli open. So you won't have like a moment of 
oxygen and no oxygen, no oxygen, no oxygen. Make sure there is a steady supply of oxygen. It also explains why. Have you all heard what is the con of giving too high FiO2 in your off? Especially during the end of off. Because you all just like 100% oxygen, pull up. 100% SpO2, yeah. KPI achieved. No? What is the con? Too high oxygen concentration. Absorption. Atelectasis. Absorption atelectasis. That means the alveoli is now 100% oxygen. All the oxygen goes out. There's no nitrogen left behind to create the splinting effect. So then alveoli collapse. Yes, that's absorption atelectasis. So prevention of atelectasis. And it minimizes four things. Work of breathing and reduces. Reduces PVR and RV afterload. Reduces VQ mismatch. And it lowers the airway resist resistance, but I put exclamation mark because this is not the lowest airway resist resistance, okay? But it's where it is quite low. <coughs> so what can affect FRC? It can be increased by being taller, being male, by standing up, COPD, the emphysema subtype, acute asthma, or giving P. It can be decreased by mostly opposite things, like shorter height, female gender, superimposition, GA, Giving muscle relaxant, having some disease, or having abdominal distension, which is compressing on the lung. And how to measure FRC? Again, you don't need to know the principle here. Oh, but I think M Chai need to know, sorry. But Medex, just know, be aware of the names. To measure the residual volume, you need to use one of these three tests. Okay. What is closing capacity? This is a new term. It was not in the spirometry diagram earlier. Kan? So this is where a, a volume, a capacity where it combines residual volume and closing volume. So let's look at this picture. So normally the first picture here, your airways are being pulled open, right? This parenchyma is pulling open the alveoli and the bronchioles. As you expire, because the alveoli volume decreases, you're expiring, right? The lung volume is reducing, the airway starts to narrow. So all these small airways start to narrow, but at some point they collapse and the air will be trapped in the alveoli. So the point, the lung volume when this happens is called the closing capacity. So normally, closing capacity is less than FRC, normally. So it doesn't happen normally. Right? Anyone here more than 66 years old? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> but this happens when CC is more or equals to FRC. So when is the CC more or equals to FRC? Number one, when CC increases. Number two, when FRC decreases. So when does CC increase? In neonates, it's quite. It's initially they because you see a CC is high at birth. So the lungs are quite stiff. So this that is why when you have newborns, <coughs> you see the SPO2 record? What's the normal SPO2 newborn? Yeah, and they, then some nurses, and then the sound, temperature, sound coming, you know. Uh, a bit higher, huh? Actually about 90, yeah. Actually about 90. I see everyone is chilling, the nurse chilling there, no pediatrician pedi 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 around because it's normal, right, for the newborn. And the reason because of that hypoxemia is this. Okay, they have a lot of airway collapse because of the CC being high. You can see in the graph, at birth, the CC is this much. At six years old, it drops here. And then it gradually increases throughout your life. So at 44 years old, as long as, as, sorry, as uh, 44 years old, once you are lying down supine, your CC goes more than FRC. So you have a small airway collapse. But at 66 years old, even when you're standing up sitting, there is already airway collapse. So that's what this graph is trying to tell you. Understand? So the other situation is whenever FRC decreases. So I already covered earlier abdominal distension, lung disease, and all this. Will cause the FRC to drop. 
you can drop below the CC. Remember, FLC normally is 30 meters per kilo, so it goes lower, below the CC, so you have airway collapse. When you have airway collapse, you get VQ mismatch, when you get VQ mismatch, you get hypoxia. Okay, and the SPO2 drops, PA2 drops. How to measure the closing volume? Because you CC is a combination of closing volume and residual volume, right? So the residual volume you need to measure with the test in the last two slides ago. So to measure closing volume, you use Fowler's method. Remember the name. Okay, lung compliance is change in volume per unit change in pressure. Two types, static. So when there is no airflow, so you cease airflow. Means the thing affecting the lung compliance is just the elasticity of the lung and surface tension. And the alveoli. So the normal value is 200 mL per cm water. Now, dynamic lung compliance is when there is continuous airflow. So usually when you see the lung compliance on your ventilator, that is usually dynamic lung compliance. So you need to do a hole, right? Inspiratory, expiratory hole to actually see the lung compliance, the static lung compliance. So you can see this picture, there is what we call hysteresis. So when you start from residual volume, during inspiration, initially it's difficult because you need to overcome the elastic recoil and the surface tension. And then the compliance gets very high, somewhere around FRC. That's where compliance is the highest. And then it flattens out because the lung is maximally expanded like a balloon. The balloon is fully inflated. You cannot expand anymore. So it flattens down again. And during expiration, it drops like that. So this hysteresis is mostly because of surface tension. And this picture also shows another thing. Can you see this? Usually, your alveoli and the bases are somewhere around here. They are very small lung volume. Okay, this area. So those closer to FRC have very high compliance. That means alveoli and the bases actually have higher compliance, but they're small. They have not fully expanded. The alveoli at the apex they are already fully expanded. They are here. Kembangudi. So they have low compliance because they cannot expand anymore. So this is the opposite of what you think logically. Okay? So take home message is alveoli at the base have a higher compliance, apex lower compliance. That means ventilation is more to the base. Okay? The higher the compliance, the more the ventilation. So again, it's opposite of what you think is logic, but that's how it is because of this. So when looking at the whole lung, the respiratory system, is a combination of two things. Compliance of the lung and compliance of the chest wall. So normal lung compliance is 200, mentioned already. Chest wall is the same, 200. You don't need to remember all this, but the take home message is total respiratory compliance is 100. Okay? Normal lung is 200, normal chest wall is 200. But when you combine both together, they become 100 because when you add them, you need to add as a reciprocal or they lie in series, not parallel. Again, take home message from all this, you don't even need to know all this, I think, is the respiratory system compliance is less than the each component. 100, 200, 200. Understand? Mm -hmm. 100. So when you look at factors, okay, there are a lot of things here, okay, you don't need to know all, but I just put all the examples. When you talk about things which affect respiratory system compliance, we think of things which affect lung compliance, and things which affect chest wall compliance. And I can guarantee you, most of these things you can just, you know, just make up on the spot. All of you know it. So what can increase lung compliance? Just having surfactant, breathing in FRC, standing up, um, if it's pathological, and phycema. What can reduce lung compliance? It's common sense. Anything which is making the lung more congested, APO, hemorrhage, pneumonia, ARDS, so on. What about chest wall? What can increase make the chest wall more compliant? So things which open up the chest wall. Connective tissue diseases such as loss, having a rib fracture, open chest, flail chest, or reduced muscle tone, your muscle are weak, like myasthenia gravis, motor neuron disease. What can reduce chest wall compliance will be having a very really stiff chest wall. So, hypospoliosis, active factors, excavator, and lipase, 
for abdominal distension, compressing up, pushing up in the chest. Okay? You don't need to know every single one, but just be aware this is how you categorize. It's a fact that it's important because it's going to be one whole question as well in the exam. So it is made up 80% phospholipid, the vast majority is DPTC. The rest will be proteins and neutral lipids made by type 2 pneumocytes, fed into lamellar bodies, and increased production will be stimulated by steroids and thyroid hormones. That's why we give that's why they give steroids to this. Yeah. So what does surfactant do? Reduces alveolar surface tension. By increasing the lung, by reducing the alveolar surface tension, you increase the lung compliance, you reduce the work of breathing. It increases the alveolar stability. It prevents the smaller alveolar collapse. So again, I don't think you need to know in detail, but be aware, the law of Laplace says that smaller alveoli should collapse first, but the radius is small. But because of surfactant, it prevents this. So the smaller alveoli don't collapse. If the alveoli dry, it reduces transudation. It, it acts as a layer on the epithelium, of the epithelium, prevents fluid from the capillaries entering the alveoli. It's also part of innate immunity. It has all these proteins which opsonize uh, bacteria. So when is surfactant reduced in highland membrane disease, what we used to call IRDS, recurrent aspiration, uh, heavy smokers, reduced from blood flow and so on. All this will reduce surfactant or surfactant deficiency. Okay, work of breathing is the work required to move the lung, right? And normally it's just a small percent of your total uh, oxygen consumption. Anyone know what is the normal oxygen consumption of the whole body? But per meal per minute. Whole body. Now, all of you now minimum oxygen consumption, I can say. Normally. Two hundred and fifty mil per minute. Okay? Or three point five mil per kilo per minute. So this is a very small percent of it. So there's two types of work. You need to do the lung needs to do elastic work. Remember just now I said in static compliance, elastic is called a press wall. And the alveolar surface tension. So elastic work is to overcome that. Whereas non-elastic work, also known as resistive work, is to overcome airway and tissue resistance, mostly airway resistance. So during static breathing, you only need to overcome elastic work. But during dynamic breathing, it's both because air is going in and out, so you need to overcome airway resist resistance. From that, you have this work of breathing curve. So let's just process it slowly. On the x-axis is the intrapleural pressure. So during inspiration, the pressure goes more negative, right? So the lungs expand. Why I see is the volume above the FRC. That means the FRC is a certain volume. So this is whole thing is the tidal volume. This shows tidal volume. This is not like the compliance curve, which shows from residual volume to TLC. This is only showing the tidal volume. The normal work during tidal, tidal breathing. So it has two components. The elastic work is the triangle from A, C, B, A. This one, this is elastic work. So the non elastic work is this downward. Okay? A, B, C, B prime A. So notice it's made up of two parts. There's an inspiration part, which is this half, the yellow color, and the expiration part, which is this half, the blue color. Everyone understand? So the work of breathing for elastic is the triangle. For the non-elastic is this leaf, which has two parts. So what can you notice from here? The expiration for the non-elastic work, the expiration phase is within the Elastic work within the triangle. That means you don't need additional work for expiration. You don't need additional work to overcome non elastic uh, or airway resistance during expiration. 
Because during inspiration, what happens to this work? It is thought as energy. Okay, because your lung tissue is kenyang. It can store potential energy. So energy is thought to do this work. Then, during inspiration, a bit more work is needed to overcome airway resistance. But for the expiratory part of the non-elastic work, its energy is gained from release of the energy during the elastic work. It's contained within here, so you don't need any extra energy. So in summary, this graph is trying to show what all of you already know. That expiration is a passive process. You don't need any additional energy for expiration. It's just the release of the elastic tissue, the potential energy. Okay? So from there, you can kind of figure out what happens when you have increase of one type of work. So when you have high elastic work, When is elastic work increase? <coughs> what disease? Mm. You know there's restrictive lung disease and obstructive lung disease, right? So, restrictive lung disease, that's good. So, in restrictive lung disease, elastic work increase. In obstructive lung disease, non-elastic work increase. Okay? So, if a patient were to have restrictive lung disease, how do you think this graph will change? Which one, which one increases in size? Which? Two. <laughs> See now. Yeah. Which area increases? Patient with lung fibrosis. Again, uh, restrictive lung disease, elastic work increase. So which one is the elastic work? AC. The triangle. Yes. So the triangle will increase, mm. but the leaf size will be the same. But in obstructive lung disease, COAD and asthma, the triangle size is the same, but the leaf becomes bigger. Okay, now you imagine the leaf is becoming bigger. So this part of the leaf that you have to, this part of the leaf that you have to. What does it mean? When the expiration part of the leaf becomes bigger. It is now no longer within the triangle. So expiration becomes active. Mm. Yes. So normal like that. Restricted lung disease, triangle that is up, but the leaf size is still the same. The width. But obstructive lung disease, the leaf that is up. So this is what happens in COAD and asthma. You can see that the, there's a part here which is no longer in the triangle. Now you need more work for expiration, which normally you don't need. Right, that's why a big part of management of obstructive lung disease is to try to reduce the resistive work of breathing. So you're going to give bronchodilators and so on. Is that? Right, so how to minimize work of breathing? You can try to reduce the elastic work, make sure peak is optimal, make sure the positioning is optimal, so you pop up the patient, use surfactant in like infants or units. You can treat the condition causing the high elastic work. So APO, pneumonia, pulmonary hemorrhage, and so on. You have to optimize respiratory. So remember that elastic work decreases with increased respiratory. That's why patients with lung fibrosis, you see they will breathe more frequent, but more shallow. So their respiratory is high, cardiac volume is small. So they want to reduce the elastic work. And the opposite happens in COD asthma. Okay. They try to breathe large tidal volume, smaller rate. They need to have the smaller rate to allow more time for expiration, the airflow. That's what you all are doing, right? You're trying to keep the rate low, then you're going to increase the E time, expiratory time. So for re to reduce non-elastic work, you're going to promote amina flow so you can give heliox, increase airway radius, use bronchodilators, you want to use a larger EPT. You can reduce the length of the airway, give the track, put patient on tracky, you know, patient long the ventilated armor. So you want to reduce the work breathing, so do a tracheostomy. And you reduce the length of the breathing circuit. So that's what we do in pediatrics. Eh? We don't want very long circuit with a lot of dead space. So we reduce it because we want to reduce the non-elastic work. 
And what I mentioned just now, the optimal respirate is the opposite for obstructive lung disease. Okay, hypoxemia is defined as low partial pressure of oxygen blood, below 260. When you talk about causes, always divide it this way. Either a normal A gradient or a raised A gradient. Do all of you know what A gradient is? Okay, you can easily find the calculator in your phone. So it's the difference between the P alveolar O2 and P arterial O2. Okay, it uses the gas alveolar gas equation to calculate. So normal A gradient, two causes. Either there's a low FIO2 or alveolar hypoventilation. There's a raised A gradient, it's either a DQ mismatch, diffusion impairment, or shunt. Okay, let me give you an example. Oh, yeah, important, thing, important thing here is shunt will not improve with increasing FIO2, especially. So just like I taught you all just now, if you have patient shock or ischemia in part 2, recovery, whatever. so the same thing. Patient SpO2 is 90%, you do ABG, PO2 is 50. And you have to think of differential diagnosis. So you calculate the A gradient. Okay, you can easily find the calculator online if you don't want to memorize. And you see, if the A gradient is normal, it's one of this. A gradient raise is one of these three. So you can narrow down the causes. So patient in Paku, what could have caused a low FIO2? Low FIO2. It's very specific situation. When was that? When the clue is nitrous oxide. Are you aware of this diffusion hypoxia? Nothing up. Like one person said that. Okay, so anyway, if you give nitrous oxide and at the end of the op, if you don't give high flow oxygen, the nitrous oxide will dilute the oxygen in the alveoli. So the oxygen in the alveoli becomes lower than normal. So that's one of the causes of low FIO2. That's called diffusion hypoxia. Okay, alveolar hyperventilation. What can cause alveolar hyperventilation in your What do things NS does? What do things surgeon does? Remember, your respiratory center is in your brain, right? So, mungkin intracranial bleed, okay? Maybe the patient had a stroke, intra or all this will cause alveolar hyperventilation. Okay. What about DQ mismatch, deficient impairment, mutation, and shunt? So, we're going to cover that next, okay? So, VQ relationship normally, remember this picture just now? Ventilation decreases from the base to the apex. That means ventilation is higher at the base. Lower the apex. Right? That's what we established just now because compliance is higher at the basal alveoli compared to apical alveoli. The basal alveoli are down here, this area. Apical alveoli are on the top here. So they have more compliance at the base, so more ventilation. Okay? So for Q, for perfusion in a standing per, uh, upright person, perfusion also decreases from the base of the apex to the lung. And that's just because of hydrostatic pressure gradient. As you go higher, hydrostatic pressure is lower. Right? So the base of the lung has a greater hydrostatic pressure. So these are called the west zones. So this is also going to come up. West zones always comes up in minutes. Okay? So you need to know what the west zone. So zone one is when because the hydrostatic pressure is low, the alveolar is, is alveolar pressure is higher in the arterial and venous, so you have collapse the blood vessel. And zone 2, arterial is higher than alveolar, but alveolar is higher than venous, so you have partial collapse, you have what we call waterfall effect or scarring resistance. At the base of the lung, alveolar at the base of the lung have continuous flow, because the artery is higher than the venous, which is higher than the alveolar pressure. Okay? These are the three vessels. Okay, you need to know at least three. Pressure flow, perfusion is higher 
at the base compared to the apex. Any question? So in a standing patient, let's focus on this side first. Huh? For lung or base to the apex, ventilation drops slowly. So if you look at the graph, this side of the graph the base, this side of the apex, you can see ventilation gradually drops. But perfusion drops steeply from the apex to the base. You understand, right? We already established ventilation drops because of the compliance difference. Perfusion drops because of hydrostatic pressure. But the amount they drop is different, the rate that they drop is different. Ventilation drops slowly, perfusion drops abruptly, more steep. <clears throat> so because of that, if you take V bahagi Q, you'll see the VQ curve going upwards like this. Okay? Ventilation bahagi perfusion, it won't be a straight line because the way they drop is not the same. Increase this line. So VQ ratio increases. At the base, it is low, which is 0.6. At the apex, is high, which is 3. Understand? So when you go from the base to the apex, three things happen. Ventilation drops slowly, perfusion drops a lot quickly, VQ ratio increases. Right? So in a normal person, when you look at the whole lung, your VQ is actually not one. There's a part of your lung where ventilation is less. Usually the basis. Because of airway collapse. But when you exercise, your VQ approach one. Ideally, you want VQ to be one. It means you want five liter per minute ventilation, five liter per minute perfusion. But in reality, it's about point eight. But it can increase to one during exercise. So anytime the VQ ratio is not close to one, if it goes away from one, it goes smaller or higher, you get hypoxemia. Okay? You always want VQ to be as close to one as possible. Right? Too low is bad, too high is bad. So because of these three differences, these are all the things which will change. This is basically what I just said. Right? Lung base, higher V and Q, lower VQ. Yeah? This is lung base. Huh? The alveoli is smaller because they're not, they're not inflated, overinflated like the alveoli apex, like the compliance curve just now, right? the balloon. They are just starting to increase in size. So because there's a lower VQ, there's more perfusion and ventilation, the PaO2 is lower. But ventilation is providing the oxygen. Perfusion is sending the CO2 to the alveoli. Ventilation is sending the oxygen to the alveoli. So when VQ is low, oxygen will be low, CO2 will be high in the alveoli. Understand? And the blood draining the alveoli will have a lower pH because CO2 is higher. As CO2 is higher, you get less pH in the system. Lower pH. So they like to ask this. Okay? Difference between base and apex. So that in the apex, the opposite happens. There's a few clinical phenomena seen from this. Okay? The apex has a higher PO2. Anyone? Clinical relevance. The apex of the lung has higher PO2. TB, excellent. Because TB love oxygen. Bacteria love oxygen. That's why TB goes to the apex. Because of this. What about bats? Bat. Flower. Where do they get TB? They get TB at the base. What about it? Yeah. <laughs> really? Somebody actually looked into this. <laughs> so when do you get VQ mismatch? Easy. Just anything which affects V or anything which affects Q. Increase or decrease. Right? So examples of decreased ventilation. A decreased ventilation will reduce the V. So the VQ ratio decreases. So it can be any airway problem such as this, parenchymal problems such as this, pleural problems such as this. Just think anything which reduces ventilation. So your tidal volume instead of 500, now it's 100. So what could have caused? Anything with decreased perfusion will increase the VQ ratio. So again, okay, whatever will reduce the blood supply to the lung. 
So severe hypertension, PE, right heart failure, IPD. Okay, any question? So oxygen transport is like this, and you go a bit faster. So the content we covered just now in cardio, right? Remember this? But oxygen delivery, you calculate using the oxygen flux. So oxygen flux equation is the CaO2 equation, kali 10, kali kali apu. So normally we have 1,000 mils of oxygen going to the tissues per minute. But remember I said just now, normally the whole body only consumes about 250 mils per minute. So we have a surplus, four times more oxygen than needed going to the tissue. This is good luck, eh? So how are you going to improve tissue DO2? Let's say patient develops tissue hypoxia latent cirrhosis. What you can do is improve the HB, increase the SAO2 or PO2, or you can increase the cardiac output. So how are you going to increase the cardiac output? Either increase the preload, increase the contractility, or decrease the afterload. Okay. OHDC, again, need to know. So important points is shape is sigmoid because of property binding. There's an ICU point. So there's a point around here where I think all of you know a lot of PO2, SPO2, sorry, PO2 goes below 60, SPO2 will drop very fast. That's the ICU point. There's a mixed venous point here. The PO2 is 40, SPO2 is 75%. And something we call P50. This is where SPO2 is 50%. Normally PO2 is 26.6. We use this P50 to tell you whether the curve has shift left or right. So if the value is more than 26, means it has shift right. Value less than 26, it has shift left. So it's in the EVG. And you want to see it or not in the EVG. There's actually a P50 there. So that tells you where the OHDC is. So based on that, you can think of different causes. So leftward shift are all this. Rightward shift is all this. Okay? I will share this slide. Don't worry. So CO2 is carried in three ways. Oxygen in two ways, CO2 in three. CO2 mainly is bicarbonate, 90%. So the CO2 in the blood diffuses into the plasma, binds to water, enzyme carbonic anhydrase to convert it to carbonic acid. The breakdown to bicarb and hydrogen ion. So it's carried as bicarb. Yeah? The bicarb will be sent back out of the cell, exchanged with water. About 5% is carbamino hemoglobin. So the CO2 which binds to uh, here. Okay, so CO2 which binds to HB becomes carbamion hemoglobin and a small amount will dissolve straight into blood just like oxygen also dissolve. So the importance here is to appreciate the CO2 dissociation curve. So in the arterial blood, this line, this first line, the CO2, PCO2 is 40, the CO2 content is 48. That's how much CO2 is being carried. But in venous blood, the PCO2 is 46, CO2 content is 52. So venous blood carries more CO2 than arterial blood. But there is something called Haldane effect. Haldane effect means that deoxyhemoglobin can bind more CO2 than oxyhemoglobin. Without the Haldane effect, the difference will only be 48 increased to 50. But Blood, venous blood can carry an extra 2 mL of CO2 because of the Haldane effect. Because the oxyhemoglobin is more attracted to CO2. The other take home message here is the shape. CO2 is linear, the dissociation curve is linear. OHDC, oxygen, is sigmoid and it has a plateau. That means your blood can keep carrying more and more CO2 if CO2 goes higher. Alright? This is one of the last few slides. So, again, one more question is probably going to be about this the difference between pulmonary and systemic circulation. So, you can read this table yourself, but in summary, pulmonary, everything is less. It has a same flow, it has to match, they must be equal. The pressure is lower, about 1 6 lower. Resistance is lower, about 10 times. Volume is very really lower, about 10 times. It responds to hypoxia and hypercapnia in opposite ways. System and it's also affected by lung volume, recruitment, and distension. Whereas systemic is mainly affected by tissue metabolism. So, if skeletal muscle is working, there will be more vasodilation. Right? I think the last slide, oops. So, 
Remember just now we talked about hypoxia. So this is hypo just now hypoxemia. This is hypoxia. They're not the same thing. Hypoxemia is PA2 less than 60. Hypoxia is oxygen reduction, inability to use oxygen at the tissue itself in the mitochondria. And the causes are different. So hypoxia, hypoxia is hypoxemia. PA2 less than 60. Hypoxemia is this category. Remember the five causes based on the normal or raised AA gradient. Anemic hypoxia is when PA2 is normal. So you're not hypoxemic, but the blood cannot carry as much oxygen. So, anemia lah. Okay? So, carbon monoxide poisoning. So all of you know that carbon monoxide binds more avidly to hemoglobin, 230 times more. So, it's like having anemia. Tannin hypoxia is when the cardiac output is reduced. There's no blood flow, it's shock. And histotoxic hypoxia is Oxygen is reaching the tissues, no problem. But the tissues cannot use the oxygen. Okay? So you get this in sepsis, you get this in cyanide poisoning. So the mitochondria itself is inhibited, you can't use the oxygen anyway, even though oxygen is enough. Yeah. Any questions? So Helen, in fact, some uh, she was asking about Helen and Boss. Helen is here, I showed you. This is Helen, this shows Helen effect. It means without Helen effect, the amount of oxygen which can be carried will increase by only this amount. So in arterial blood, it is 48. In venous blood, it is 50 from here to here. But because of Helen effect, we can increase by another two. So from here to here. So Helen effect means that deoxyhemoglobin has an increased ability to carry CO2 and vice versa. Okay, oxyhemoglobin will bind CO2 less, deoxyhemoglobin will bind CO2 more. So venous blood can pick up more CO2. But in venous blood, there's more deoxyhemoglobin, right? Which is good, which is what we want, because most of the CO2 is being produced and released into venous blood. So Bohr effect is something like that, but it's for oxygen hemoglobin. So this one, this shows the boy effect. Boy effect refers to this part. Okay. Whether it shifts the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen when CO2 is around. So when CO2 is high, the curve shifts right. That means hemoglobin has a lower affinity for CO2. But when CO2 is low, the curve shifts left. It makes hemoglobin more attracted to oxygen. So again, this is good because in the lung pulmonary arteries, is your CO2 higher or lower than in the system in the tissue? Lower, yes, because that's why CO2 is being sent out ventilated. So pulmonary capillaries have low CO2. So in your pulmonary capillaries, do you want the hemoglobin to pick up oxygen or release oxygen? Pick, pick up oxygen. Okay, it's in the pulmonary capillaries. You want your brain to pick up oxygen, right? So you want the curve to shift left. You want it to be more attracted to oxygen. But the vice versa happens in the systemic circulation. Systemic circulation, CO2 is very high. So the tissue is releasing the CO2. So you want the hemoglobin to pick up more oxygen or release more oxygen? Release, because it has reached its destination. You can you can release the oxygen. Huh? So it has to reduce Affinity, so the curve is right. That is Bohr effect. The effect of CO2 on oxyhemoglobin uh, dissociation. Okay. Any other question? So I'm encroaching into. Is it okay for more questions? Or? Okay. Okay. Any question? So, lung compliance is a good question to me. Lung compliance in the elderly, does it change? So actually, all three things can happen. It can either don't change, it can increase, or it can decrease. Because it depends on what is happening to the elderly. So if the elderly patient is the type, you know, good genes, you know, makan, uh, healthy food every day, don't smoke, they don't work in the kilang or what, lung is pristine, beautiful lung, 
then it won't change. Their lung compliance will stay the same. But if they're a smoker, heavy smoking, they work in a you know, factory with a lot of smoke, they go towards emphysema. If they develop emphysema, the lung compliance will increase. Please. Emphysema makes, destroys the parenchyma of the lung. So it makes it more stretchy. So the compliance increases. But if they're the type of elderly who go the opposite direction, you know, they have other type of occupational disease or they have autoimmune disease, they get lung fibrosis. Then their lung yes. compliance will decrease. So on and off, you'll find the rare MCQ which asks true or false, the lung compliance increase in elderly. So that, should, that actually is not a good MCQ because it can go anyway. All right, depending on whether they have fibrosis, emphysema or normal. Any question? <laughs>